let's go ahead and get started and uh, we'll see what the Lord has for us tonight. Dear Lord, again, we are so thankful that we can come into your presence, that we can open your word, we can partake of all that you have for us there. I pray again tonight that you would bless your word as it goes out. Anoint my lips to speak those words that you would have. Anoint the word as it goes out and anoint our hearts to receive. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, tonight uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the increasing multitudes. Now, we, we talked, we just finished the, the last little section there, which was basically preaching to those in Galilee and around Capernaum. He's still going to be doing that. However, what we see now is a big influx of followers. Uh, he's, instead of talking about, uh, and there was people gathered, now we're going to see there were multitudes gathered. Uh, his, his, his fame has now picked up. And we're going to see a lot of people coming here. Uh, what I want to uh, start off with tonight, uh, this is, uh, by the way, let me go back to that one. This is what... Just a minute here. This will be all right. Uh, this is where we are in the third period time frame on the timeline. Uh, we started off down there uh, with the first Passover. And the Passover always falls on 15 Nisan, which is uh, the Jewish month of Nisan on the 15th of the month. Uh, here we had three months, uh, and then we went to the Judean ministry, and he was there about six days in which he visited Samaria. He went to visit Nazareth, he went, visited Canaan, we had the wedding supper, uh, water turned into wine. Then there's about three months in here, and then he went to minister to Galilee. He healed the leper, the healing of the palsied man. Matthew was called, the four fishermen are called, and we go to the second Passover. So this period of time here is one year. Now how we break these up, we don't know. But we do know from Passover to Passover is one year. So now we've covered from here to here roughly a, a year and a half of his public ministry right in that, or his uh, uh, yeah, ministry in that area. Second Passover, after the second Passover, we have the healing at the Pool of Bethesda, which we talked about last week. The, uh, uh, the plucking grain on the Sabbath, which... This is what aroused the problem with the, with the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the healing of the withered hand, which he performed in uh, Capernaum, in the, one of the synagogues in Capernaum. So he went right in there on the Sabbath and healed. And we covered that last week. So that's kind of where we are today. Now tonight, uh, we're going to look at this increasing, the idea of increasing multitudes and we first see this by the seashore. Now, on a previous occasion, Jesus got into a boat and had Peter push him out, you know, or the fisherman bring him out from shore enough, far enough out so he could preach to the multitudes. Well, here he does it again. And we see it first in Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Now, this is from last week when he was in Capernaum. That first verse, that just kind of sets it up for you. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew, withdrew from there, and great multitude followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant, who I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to the victory. And in his name Gentiles will trust. Might not say by a way a quotation from Isaiah uh, 42. 
Now we jump over to Mark chapter 3, verse 7. But Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and Jerusalem, and Idumea, and beyond the Jordan, and those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they heard how many things he was doing, came to him. So he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. For he healed many, so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. All right, so we have two different accounts of the same event. But actually, they dovetail together. Again, we're seeing the situation where Matthew looks at it from one view, and uh, Mark, in this case, is looking at it from a little different perspective. And so they pull from that event things that were... Uh, uh, you know the, that 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 they were excited about, or that uh, influenced them, and so that was what they wrote about. Remember, they wrote this several years after these events, so you know it's recollection and, and whatever. So naturally, what stuck in their minds was what was what influenced them the most, mm -hmm. and I think that's by God's design. I don't mean by any way to say it was just you know, because that's all they remembered. But I think God wanted us to see these different views because we get a different look at what's really going on here. So, first of all, we have kind of a mysterious statement here. Uh, when Jesus knew that the Jews were out to destroy him, he, fled, he, he ran away. That's basically what he's saying. He ran away to, to the Sea of Galilee and so they wouldn't destroy him. Yeah. Okay, It was not, however, in fear of his life. Um, he was not ready to be given yet. He was not ready to be destroyed yet. He had a ministry that had to be fulfilled. Let's assume that he remained in Capernaum, and here come all of the uh, uh, Pharisees and the, uh, the palace, uh, you know, the, the uh, Sanhedrin army. They had a small army, guards, came to get him. What would have happened? If he had been allowed himself to be taken, then he would have to go through the process of proving he was the Messiah and, and, the, and the trial and the whole thing. If, on the other hand, he stood there and withstood them, what would have happened? He could no longer claim being the suffering Messiah. So in order to fulfill Scripture, he could not allow himself to be put into that position of having to either defend himself or allow himself to be taken. Does that make, that, that make sense? Uh, and we're going to look a little more about this idea of the suffering Messiah as we go through uh, the Beatitudes. So he, he left, he, he went from them. And he went to the land around the Sea of Galilee. Now that was the area that was called the Wilderness. <clears throat> and even today, if you uh, uh, look at pictures of the Sea of Galilee uh, and that, that area, even though there is some buildings and stuff, you can see where it's still a, a wild-type area. It, it's uh, an area that you would call wilderness. Yes. Now, you, you have this divided as part of the, the third period. Yes, this is what, all third period. What, what defines the boundaries of the third period? Uh, that's kind of arbitrary. I'm using a book by Roberts mm -hmm. that's called the, the Harmony of the Gospels, and I'm using his divisions because it kind of makes sense. It breaks it up. You have his early life, mm -hmm. you know, his raising and so forth, and then you have his, what do we call it, pre-ministry time, probably from mm -hmm. the te temple you know, time period uh, up until he, he started his ministry. And then we have the third period, which is his ministry. From the point of his, okay, so from the point of his public ministry. Public, yes. Okay, yeah. all right, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. so we're moving through this uh, as we go. And, and there's, I think there's about seven phases or periods uh, that we're going to look at because he breaks the crucifixion down and to the mm -hmm. resurrection and so forth. It's kind of arbitrary. I mean, it's not, there's nothing in scripture, you know, that, this is the next phase, yeah. you know. 
Uh, it's kind of how you look at it. It just kind of breaks it up, makes it a little easier to, to follow, I think. <clears throat> All right, so he goes out to this wilderness area. Um, and this would be a p place where it would be difficult to find him. Um, you know, and if, if, they, if they were to, co to go after him in this area, they would have some real problems because he has this big multitude. And we know this was a concern because... You know, we read in the Gospels where the Pharisees were very, very, and the Sanhedrin was very concerned about coming against Jesus because of the multitude. Mm -hmm. So when he went into the wilderness, instead of having a few hundred people, now he had thousands of people. And that became a very formidable uh, barrier between him and the Jews. Uh, and I say Jews, I'm talking the, the, the rulers. It became a formidable barrier because if they went in there, they're liable not to come out. I mean, you know, that's, they had to really kind of think about that. And so uh, this was a time when he was building up his multitudes and his followers. Um, now, it says that there was a multitude of people that came to him. Now, these probably came primarily for the healings. Uh, you know, if you read, read it says in here, um, uh, and there are a great multitude, and, they, he, and he healed them all. That was the thing. It wasn't a, a healing meeting where you came and wondered if you might get healed. He healed them all. Nobody left that wasn't healed. Uh, and that's an interesting, and just in the modern day, uh, you've probably heard of Amy Simple McPherson started the Four Square Church. Well, uh, my folks, my grandparents, lived just a few blocks from there. And literally, they told me when I was a kid growing up, and I've heard the story over and over again, literally the ambulances would drive up in front, they'd unload their patients, take them in, and they'd leave. Because they said, we don't need to come back. They're, they're not going to need an ambulance. I mean, it was that kind of healing that everybody went in and got healed. I, I haven't heard of anybody who wasn't. You know, we think about, we think about, we hear a lot about Amy Semple McPherson and the things that happened or whatever, but you don't hear that aspect of it. Uh, and, and there's been others that have had similar, but not to the complete degree that she did. And I don't know of anybody prior to that, until except Jesus, that had almost 100% heal rate. I mean, that's, that's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. I just mentioned that because we think it can't happen in today's world. It can. It can. With the right person, it can. All right. In Jerusalem, the littlest world they came from, I think it's interesting to note, they came from Galilee, that would be Jews, uh, from Jerusalem, they came from Adumia, that would be the, that would be the descendants of Esau, uh, and um, they came from Tyre and Sidon, these were, these were Gentile areas, so you had Jews and Gentiles, and those on the other side of Jordan. Now, these could be both Jew and Gentiles because Manasseh, you know, and Gad had the other side of Jordan. But uh, also there was all these uh, Gentiles that now lived there. And so they came from all over and they were mixed. We often get the mistaken idea that Jesus was ministering, but he wasn't. He was ministering to Jews and Gentiles and healing them all. So when the centurion came, that wasn't anything out of the ordinary. No. He was healing them all. And this is one thing that was infuriating uh, the Sanhedrin to some degree, is that he was, in effect, uh, uh, casting his bread before the dogs, you know. I mean, these were dogs, these Gentiles. And yet he was healing them. He was taking care of them. Now, there's a... Um, uh, now, he, notice he, he, he instructed his disciples to have a small boat ready. <laughs> I, I kind of like, he had an escape plan, plan B, you know. And the reason he had a small boat ready is so that the multitudes would not crush him. Uh, and again, I think we have the same idea that we have with his worrying about being destroyed. If they pressed into the point where they started to crush him and physically he was in danger, what was he going to do? If he allowed them to crush him, he would have to raise from the dead. Not time yet. If he showed his divine authority and spoke the word and they all fell backwards, eh, not ready yet. Again, he would cease to be the suffering Messiah. So 
what, what I guess I'm saying here is that until he was ready to show himself as to who he was, and that wasn't until resurrection, actually, as you can talk about, you know, crucifixion allowing himself to be crucified, those two events, he wasn't ready to do that, and so until he became ready to do that, he had to put his divinity on the back burner in terms of his own self. He talked about who he was. He healed, which were all you know, examples of his divinity. But when it came to his own self, he had to put divinity on the back burner. He could not supernaturally take care of himself. The only time where we have even an indication that he may have is when they were going to throw him off of the cliff and they looked around and they couldn't find him. And he says he walked back through the multitude. Now, how did he do that? You know, I don't know. Maybe that was a situation where he just kind of changed his appearance or became invisible. I don't know. But he just kind of, maybe he just kind of blinded him so they wouldn't see him. I don't know. I don't know how he did that. But that would be the only indication that I know of that he used divinity for his own purpose as far as protecting himself. So if there's ever a question is why was he so concerned about being crushed, you know, was he afraid or something? No. Fear was not the issue. It was that he came with a purpose and his eyes and his heart were fixed on that purpose. And so everything he did had to support that purpose. And I think that's a very good lesson for us. Very good lesson. So he had this boat uh, made ready. <clears throat> another, another good reason for the boat also, besides the fact that he didn't want to be crushed, how can you teach when you've got people pressing in all around you? Now, if he had a PA system like we have today with cordless mic, it wouldn't make any difference. You know, he could stand out there and talk all day long and nobody even know where he was. You know? But he, he couldn't do that in that situation. And what did he come to do? He came to teach. We learned that last week or the week before. He came to teach. That's what he came for. And so in order to do that, he had to get away from the multitude so he could speak. So he healed everybody. And then he got pushed off in the boat, and he preached. So that was the reason for the boat. Now, there's an interesting thing here, and, uh, and I think we have to be really careful, because in, in Matthew's rendition, rendin, uh, rendin, covering, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to try to untangle that one on that one. It says, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and a great multitude followed him, and he healed them all, uh, yet he warned them not to make him known. So if we look at it in that context, it's telling the people, don't tell anybody that I healed you. But that, I don't think, is really what is meant in the scripture because we pick it up over in Mark. What does Mark say? For he healed many, so that as many as had affliction pressed him about not to touch him, and the unclean spirits whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. So I think what we see here is Matthew was lumping that idea of don't tell him who he is with those that were healed. He healed everybody, whether they were demon-possessed or whatever it was. But the ones he was really referring to here were those demons that would say, this is the Son of God. Jesus is saying, I'm not ready yet. See, again, the same idea. This was not his time to stand up and say, I'm the Son of God. You know, I've come to redeem the world. It wasn't time yet in his ministry. And so he warned the spirits, you keep quiet and don't say any more about it. And I noticed he didn't say he just kind of told them. He sternly yeah. told them. And you know what? We have that ability to sternly talk mm -hmm. to demons and devils and principalities and powers. And we think they have so much power. I've known Christians, when somebody comes in demon-possessed, you know, they almost have a heart attack. And they, they can't get close enough to the door in case, you know, they don't want to get, oh, get demon-possessed if I'm around this demon. He's going to jump out and beat me up. No, we have, mm -hmm. we have the spiritual power to sternly take control of those things. We can shut them up or we can have them tell us who they are. Either way, we can talk with them or we can stop them from talking. I know I've done it. I, 
But we have that ability, but you have to take control. You have to stand up and say, I am in control here because I have the spirit of Jesus Christ. I am standing in his stead. I am the body of Christ. Therefore, I have the authority to take over you. We don't do that anymore. We used to. I mean, the old days of Pentecost, I know, man, I've seen guys just come over the benches to come at one, one of these demons. I mean, man, they were ready to go. Anymore, ah, you know, we don't even see them. We don't recognize them. We wouldn't know one if one walked in the door anymore because we just don't have that. See, but Jesus did. All right, so... <coughs> Now, I think it's interesting also to notice that the demons, when they saw him, fell down before him. Demons, and they, they understand when they come into the, into the presence of royalty. They understand when they come into the presence of the master. When they came before Jesus, they understood they were in front of the master. The master, master. They have a master, the devil. But there's a master that's greater than the devil. And he, when they came into his presence, they fell before him. Now, I've heard people say, well, you know, all you have to do is just worship God and you're going to be all right. Well, these demons, by falling down, were worshiping. It was a form of worship. Okay. And they were saying the truth. You are the Son of God. We recognize who you are. People say, well, if you confess the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saved. What do these demons do? Mm -hmm. Are they saved? No. No. So that is just, that's a situation where we have a misquotion or a misunderstanding of Scripture. And it happens all the time. Uh, it's like the Scripture, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Is it possible to believe and not be saved? Is it possible to be saved and not believe? Yes, it is in both cases. So, uh, you know, we have to be very careful that we use all of Scripture and not pull out one or two verses and try to build this big thing on one or two verses. Because, because it doesn't work. You're going to get yourself wrapped up around the axle. Uh, it's like people tell me, you just got to believe on the Lord and you'll be saved. I said, okay, have you cast any demons out lately? How many people have you healed this week? You speak in tongues? Oh, no, no, we don't do it. Well, these signs shall follow them that believe. In other words, if you don't do it, you don't have the signs following, or do you believe? A simple statement. So you have to be careful. That's all I'm saying. Uh, these all fit together with repentance and presenting a, a holy life and so forth. All of these fit together to make salvation. They're all parts of it, but they're just parts. You can't take one by itself. It's like going out to your car, taking the front wheel off and saying, I got my car, I'm ready to go. Jump on the front wheel, we're going to go. Doesn't work. Okay. All right, so he went to the seashore. And um, something to notice, he was the suffering Messiah, and he was sent to be a servant not a soldier. Not a soldier. Uh, let's look at Isaiah. That's 42, by the way. And it's, it's quoted pretty much uh, in its entirety here. Uh, Isaiah 42, and um, we're starting with verse 1. Behold my servant who I uphold, my elect one in whom I sh my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon me, him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlines <clears throat> shall wait for his law. Now that's the actual scripture. Uh, it's translated a little differently by Matthew. Um, 
but, but it's basically um, the same thing. Um, and except Matthew added this, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Okay, what is he talking about there? Well, this whole portion of scripture points to the fact that the coming Messiah, the first time he comes, will not come as a soldier. He will come as a servant. Notice what it says, the idea of judgment to the Gentiles. Um, first of all, the spirit, what spirit? Who's talking here? It's God, right? He says, I will put my spirit, my spirit, um, on him. I will put my spirit upon him or on him. And what's he going to do with that spirit? He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Now, if we look at that in our understanding of justice in the English language, we would say he's going to come as a judge and he's going to judge the Gentiles. Well, no. <laughs> That's not what that means. In fact, this particular word is very, very interesting. Um, uh, I, I spent some time cruising around through the lexicons, figuring this one out. But really what this word has is the idea of judgment to the Gentiles is that Jesus would bring or make the Gentiles subject to the laws of right and wrong. Hmm. Okay? Um, the Hebrew word used for judgment in Isaiah 42, it means law or commands and brings the whole system of truth to the Gentiles. They would not be subject to the law of Moses, but rather the higher law of truth. Mm. Now, Paul, I think, you know, I, I love the first nine chapters, you probably know of Romans, because Paul so well explains the difference between the Jew and the Gentile. It says the Jews had their laws, and they had to go through all the laws of Moses, and they were expected to keep them, but they didn't keep them in their heart, and so Paul talks about how that was supposed to be in their heart. But when it comes to the Gentiles, he says they also had a law, but it was the law of the conscience. He clearly says they followed the law of their conscience, which was the law that was in place before the law of Moses. But you see, there's no guidance to the conscience. The conscience appears, it, it, it depends entirely upon the individual. If you are a, and I'm going to use the term righteous man, not in the term of righteousness before God, but, but somebody who is just and somebody who is fair, and you follow the conscience, the, the assumption we have to draw from what Paul says is that the Gentiles, if you were that kind of a person and you followed your conscience, then you would be, uh, you would escape hell, I'll put it that way. That's kind of the assumption that we draw. Now, could be or could not be. That's, as I say, it's an assumption. Nowhere in Scripture does it tell us positively. Other than they had that law to follow, but it was dependent upon the individual. Jesus, when he came on the scene and began teaching all of the sermons, and we're going to look at the uh, start of the Sermon on the Mount tonight, these were presented to the Gentiles as well as the Jew. You know, we, we historically, I think, in church, we've been taught that Jesus sat around and all these Jews came out and he was expounding the law of Moses and applying it to the Jews. No, not at all. He was expounding a higher law, the law of truth. And by doing that, he was exposing the Gentiles to the law of truth. In other words, once he told them, they were now responsible to respond to the law of truth. So he was applying law to them that they had never had before. That's what the scripture means. That's a, that's a tremendous understanding. You know, we also get the mistaken idea that the Gentiles didn't get the gospel didn't get any, until Paul went out and talked to them and Peter. No. They were getting it here just the same time the Jews were getting it. Right? Now, they didn't have the experience until Peter and Paul went out 
the, the experience of Pentecost and, and actual personal salvation, but they were giving all the rules, all of the law they needed was being given to them, and we're going to see this in the Beatitudes. All right. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> so he will cry, he will not cry or shout as a warrior and run through the streets arousing the people to battle. You say, where do you get that? Well, it says here, he will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. That, that whole phrase in there, that whole section refers to a, a, a warrior. Uh, if you want to have a revolt, you know, in, in, in a city, and you're going to revolt against what's going on, what do you do? You get up and you holler, you get everybody, you have as many people as you can, you go through the streets, you get all your followers, you get everybody agitated, and then you have a rebellion, okay? As a suffering Messiah, Jesus did not come to rebel against anything. That's another misnomer. We think he came, you know, and when he was teaching, he was really instilling the idea that we got to get these Jews, you know, we got to beat them down, and we got to... No, that wasn't what he was coming He didn't come for that. Not at all. And so he didn't go through the streets, and he didn't raise a big clamor. There was a big clamor raised, but he didn't do it. He did everything he could to just walk away. All right? He would not break the bruised reed. What was that? That was a symbol of feebleness, the poor and the oppressed. He would not oppress them as a conqueror would. In other words, he didn't come and say, I'm the Messiah, and you guys are all stupid. And I'm going to see that all of you get taken out of all. You're all going to be beat down. We first of all have to understand when he talks about the poor here, uh, the, the bruised reed uh, had to do with the poor or the oppressed. He was talking about Israel as a whole. They were poor. They were oppressed. I mean, even in the best of times, they were poor because they didn't have in their hearts what they needed to have. See, Jesus wasn't concerned about the outside as much as he was concerned about the inside. That's why he came to preach. He took care of the outside, but he was more interested in the inside. And so he didn't to crush or to further break that reed, to smash down that reed that was already broken. And I think, I think we can, uh, I think pretty safely, kind of compare that to the idea that the, 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 uh, the vine was cut off and another vine was grafted in, being the Gentiles in the church age, but he didn't kill it. He cut it off, but he didn't kill it. How do we know? Because he grafted the original back in again in prophecy, okay? So he didn't come to completely destroy it, but he came that it might one day have life. And so that's what this is talking about. He, he didn't come as the conqueror and go and just beat him up. I'm come bringing in a whole new thing here, you know, and I'm just going to steamroller over, over, over all of you. He didn't do that. And by the way, that's not what the gospel does. He would not completely quench the smoking flax. What is that? The smoking flax was the wick of a lamp that had run out of oil. You know how you have a kerosene lamp and it runs out of oil? What happens? The wick sits there and smokes. No flame, no light, basically worthless, and it's smoking away. He didn't come to completely put out that flame. What is he talking about? The law of Moses. He did that, that law of Moses, the oil had run out of the law of Moses centuries before. The presence of God had left the Holy of Holies. They, were, they had not heard from God for 400 years. They were going through all of the uh, ceremonies. It was like a wick that was just smoking. There was no light. There was no oil. Mm. There was no gladness. There was nothing except a smoking flax. Mm. He did not come to snuff out the flax. He didn't come to shut off the law. 
He didn't come to just say, all right, I'm done with the law. In fact, this might shock you, the law is still in effect today. People said, well, what are you talking about? Yeah, it's still in effect. How do I know? Because the book of Revelation. It talks about the fact, and also Isaiah, that the sacrifices are going to be started again, that the worship of the temple is going to be built again, and God sanctions that. Now, is that the only way of salvation? No, he has brought in a bigger truth, a better truth. But he didn't take the law of Moses and snuff it out. It's still there for the Jews. And it has to do with their nation, not the individuals. Okay? So we have to understand that. But I think this, that's powerful when you think about it, because we as Christians... We think, well, those crazy Jews over there, they should know they've already, they're done with, and they're all going to go split hell wide open because we're the church, and we got it all. Mm -hmm. It's not what Jesus did. He didn't come so that we could set ourselves up, we being the church, and say, we've got it all. Yeah. No. He didn't do that. All right. He would allow the spiritless worship of the Jews to continue until the truth that he will send forth will be victorious. When is that? What is the truth he sends forth? <clears throat> what are we talking about here? We could say it's the day of Pentecost. Possibly. But that isn't really what Jesus came to represent at this time. What was he representing? The Messiah. Messiah is not a church term. When he comes as the conquering Messiah, when he comes to set up his kingdom, there will not be any more law of Moses. Find it anywhere in scriptures, it's not there. In fact, it says emphatically that everybody will worship him. There's no sacrifices, there's no offerings, there's no, well, there's offerings, but not, not in the ceremonial offerings and all of the stuff that was in the law. That's done away with, but not until he comes in full victory. Whew. That's going to be powerful. That's going to be powerful. We, we, we want to look at the church all the time. We want to keep inserting the church in here. The church is something different. No, it's not different. It's built upon this. But the church is something that was grafted in in a, a particular time, and it goes away at a particular time. Okay. But he's talking basically to the Messiah approach here. Okay. All right. Notice this, and it says that... At that time, when he gains in victory, uh, Matthew says, and, his, and in his name, Gentiles will trust. And clearly, uh, Isaiah gives a beautiful picture of the messianic kingdom with people from all over the world flying in, coming in on trains and uh, you know, camel trains, just to worship and to rely and to give offerings. Oh, powerful. All right. So that's, the, um, that's where he started off um, by the seashore. Now, <clears throat> we want to look at Mark. It's interesting here. Jesus, or Matthew, doesn't uh, cover this part. Um, but Mark does, and he says that, and this is the uh, he, this is where he chooses <clears throat> the twelve disciples, the twelve apostles. I find it interesting. I'm going to use the word apostle, and I understand there were twelve disciples, but there were a lot of disciples, and that's why I'm using apostles, so we can kind of keep them separate. <clears throat> there was a lot of disciples. Disciples is somebody who follows. Now we know he had four disciples that he called specifically. Peter and James, John, uh, uh, Peter, James, John, uh, uh, where am I? Uh, Matthew, those four for sure, and Nathan, which uh, seemed to be Bartholomew. 
Um, so he had these guys, but notice what he does here. Now he's, he's been preaching by the seashore. Uh, and he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him. Then he appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have power to heal sickness, and to cast out demons. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanarges, that is, sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, and they went into a house. Now Luke says, uh, covers it this way, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. All right, so... We have his seashore ministry, and apparently after that event, he went up into the mountain and prayed all night. Now, Mark doesn't talk about him praying all night, but Luke, who is the consummate historian, puts it into the detail that he went up ahead of time, spent the night in prayer. And then he called uh, uh, certain, certain ones up to the mountain. I like the way Mark puts it. He said, he called to those he, him, who he himself wanted. God doesn't call anybody he doesn't want. And I, this, is, this is, you know, it may seem obvious, but, uh, you know, if, you're, if you've been in the ministerial circles uh, and you're around ministers and missionaries and, and stuff, sometimes when you go through trials, and, and believe me, pastors, Evangelist, teacher, we all go through them just the same as anybody else. We're not exempt from it. But sometimes when you go through some pretty heavy stuff, and sometimes you can't hear from heaven, and sometimes you pray and nothing happens, and sometimes you're trying to get something to say, and you feel like you're banging your head against the wall. We've all been there. Sometimes it's easy to say, God, why did you call me if you didn't want me to do this? Mm -hmm. We, we get the we get the feeling sometimes that maybe we're called because we inherited it. Maybe we're called because my dad was a preacher, therefore I'm a preacher. But it doesn't work that way. And there are some who think they're preachers because their dad was a preacher, but they were never called to do that. And it's obvious who they are. I can think of one right off the bat. I was him preaching. I thought, oh my Lord. How can anybody sit and listen to this? No anointing. Nothing from off the hot off the altar. Just words. But yeah, I'm a preacher. But God calls those he wants to call. And if you're called into a ministry, no matter what it is, it's because God wanted you there or he would not have called you. So he called all these men up there. And he called them his disciples. But from them he selected twelve. Twelve. Now, I like Mark again. He, he gives us a reason why. And, and, and notice, I, I like Mark doesn't say he called them. He says he appointed them. When you have been called of God and you answer that call, God will not call you to something else. He will appoint you to something else. There's a difference between being called and appointed. You can back down out of being called. You can say, no, I don't want to be called. But it's pretty hard to back down out of being appointed. Yes. 
I don't want to open up a, a big can of worms here, but it just seems like God is always doing, throughout Scripture, doing these amazing kinds of ordinations and meeting with people on a mountaintop. Yes. Is there anything you would like to add to that as far as the significance of a mountain? Uh, there's obviously some, some things we could say. I mean, we can say, you know, you've got to be up on the mountaintop. If I was a preacher and I wanted to preach a sermon, you know, yeah, I could say, yeah, you've got to get up on the mountaintop with God if you want to get appointed. Uh, you know, you could do that. You could do that. Mm -hmm. Scripturally, I don't know that there's anything really, uh, you know, that we could use to back that up as far as a point of theology. Mm hmm it's a good example, it's a good uh, assembly maybe or something, but I don't think we'd want to put that in a theology book and say, you know, you've got to be rid of you're going to be. Uh, and the reason I say that is because we have people like Gideon. <laughs> where was Gideon when he right. was called? <laughs> he was in the... Yeah, you know, where, where was Jonah? Yeah. You know, well, yeah. so I mean, you know, we have examples that say, no, that's, that's probably not it. Um, I just think in the case of Jesus, uh, quite often when he did these sorts of things, he was, had been up on the mountain to pray. And we see him going up on the mountain to pray a lot. Uh, and I, I, I personally think the idea of the mountain wasn't so much its location as the fact it got away from people. Interesting, yeah. That's a people didn't want to climb up the mountain to follow him, you know. Right. It was a place where he could go and be away from people. There were no people up there. And we're going to look at this mountain here in a minute and you kind of see what I'm talking about. So I think that's really probably more it. Uh, isolation, a, a place of isolation. Yeah, right. And that's why he went to the wilderness. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, he went up on a mountain, <clears throat> and he called his twelve. Now you notice there's some difference in the names, but we talked about that. Uh, Judas, the son of James, um, is, uh, is, is another name for um, John, wrote the, the three gospels, so, or the three letters. So in the names, you know, don't get hung up on the names because they had several names, Thaddeus, and, you know, and, and different things. So you just have to kind of track down which, which name was being used by which writer. That's all we have to do in there. All right, so he calls them up on the mountain. Um, now the mountain, they think, was uh, the, called the Horns of Hayton. See if I can get this thing back up again. Come on. There we go. Come on. What do you mean no cast found? Hold on a second here. The internet shut down again. All right. But anyway, I had a nice picture of uh, the Mount of Hatton. What it was, uh, and uh, I have it on my laptop. Maybe you can see it on the laptop if I can. Uh, that won't open up on me now. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, it was a mountain by the Sea of Galilee, and it was an old volcano. So you went up this road, and it's not nothing in nothing in, in over there is high. We're not talking about Mount Rainier, you know. It's more like, uh, um, I don't know, Beacon Hill in Seattle. I mean, you know, it's not very high. In fact, that's probably a lot higher. But it was a volcano, and it had two peaks on each side. And if you looked at it from the top, you could see where it was probably a rim at one time, you know. So it's flat, and then it has these two peaks on each side, and you came up the road to the flat portion and on up into the peak. And they think this is probably where Jesus was at at this time. And so it's, when you read this, it looks like he went up on the mountain and then he came down to the plains or something. But he went up onto the mountain, he went up into one of these two peaks. And they're not high. I mean, you, you know, they're probably as high as this church maybe. I mean, they're, like, again, they're not high. And that's where he spent the night in prayer. And his disciples were probably down in the bottom part of this. And he came down and he called them over to himself, his disciples. And that's where he talked with them and selected his 12 apostles. 
Now, what did he call them for? First of all, foremost, that he, that they might be with him. The apostles were called to accompany Jesus wherever he went. They were to be with him at all times. Now, everything sent them off to buy food and things like that. But wherever Jesus traveled, his 12 apostles traveled with him. Up until now, it was kind of, you know, they were there sometimes and not there all the time. And his disciples kind of were there. If he was handy, they'd come over. Or if not, they'd go back to fishing for a while. I mean, it was kind of in and out, you know, with them. But they were called now and appointed to be apostles for the express purpose of being with him. Secondly, the express purpose was to go out and preach. He called these guys to be preachers. <laughs> and, and when you think about it, it's kind of funny because he calls Peter, James, and John. What were they? They were fishermen. And Andrew, they were fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector. Now, I don't think they even had one semester of speech. <laughs> you know, how could you preach? They were not learned. They didn't know the, the Torah. Uh, probably the only one that might have come close to that was Luke. He was a physician, so he was obviously, to some degree anyway, educated. Uh, we don't know about Judas, what he was. He was a money, handled the money, so he may have been a bookkeeper or trained you know, in that area. But uh, we, don't, we don't really know much about them, but probably none of them were considered, uh, you know, teachers, rabbis, going to go talk in the temple. It's, an, it's very interesting. He called people who he had to teach everything to. Mm. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's a whole lot easier to bring a new convert in and yeah. teach him things yeah. than to take an old saint and try to teach him something different. Sure. I, I get it all the time, you know. I, I, I saying we had a Bible study the other night and I was at one and uh, something was mentioned that was in error and uh, I said no that's not right it wasn't a doctrinal statement it was in fact it was it was about what Pentecostals believe and I said no that's not right I can tell you what Pentecostals believe I think I have enough of you know credibility no nope, that's not right because this is what it and what he was saying was this is what I've been taught so it has to be right <laughs> He quoted some guy, he said, this is one of the founders of Pentecost. I never heard of him. I think I know most of the founders of Pentecost by name, you know who they were. Never heard of this guy. I don't know who he was. <laughs> he made a statement that was wrong. And, uh, you know, but, but this whole idea, you know, I know what I'm doing because I'm, you know, I've been raised in this. I'm, that's what makes it hard. So Jesus took them who didn't know anything, basically, and he's going to teach them everything they know, they need to know. And he does a pretty good job. When you read Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, wow, there's some pretty good stuff in there. You know? Now Paul, we understand Paul, because he was trained in the Word. He could really take that Old Testament and twist it around and show how it fits. And so could Peter and so could John. On certain subjects, they were good. All right, so with that was that. Also, they were to have power to heal the sick. Jesus said, I'm doing great things, but I'm going to go away and greater things you're going to do. Who was he talking to? The apostles. The apostles. And we read later on that Peter had such success healing people that they actually laid the sick out in the streets just so his shadow would pass over them and they'd be healed. You know, that's, that's what you call having the gift of healing. And that's the gift of healing. They have power to cast out demons. Now, you remember when he sent them out, the 12 out for their practical practice session. Mm -hmm. And then they, they went out. They came back. The 70 came back and said, we even have power over the demons. And we cast them out. Yeah, that was a big thing in those days. Be able to have power over demons. Today, that's not a big thing. Well, I some people probably is. But you remember, they didn't have any spirit. Mm -hmm. In those days, there was no church. There was no... Holy Spirit inside. They were, oh, they were dead vessels. And, but here these men were able to do it. Wow, that was something different. <clears throat> All right, so these, these 12, they spent almost two years receiving the teaching of Jesus. And we have people mistakenly say, well, they listened for three and a half years. 
they listened to the full teaching of Jesus for three and a half, some of them, some of them for three and a half years, but the, the apostles and the teachings that they needed to be preachers themselves, they only had a little less than two years. That's was about two years. So they didn't have a lot of time. This was an accelerated Bible scholar. They were really getting with it. Um, these men would learn firsthand how to be leaders, servants, and preachers by watching Jesus and then practicing. So they not only got the word, but they got the example firsthand. Okay, so now, he called his, uh, his, his uh, 12, and now we have their ordination sermon or address. Now, we haven't thought of it, maybe you've never heard it called this. In fact, to be honest, I hadn't thought about it until today. But when Jesus was on the mountain, of all, the, the sermon on the mount here at uh, uh, the same mountain, uh, it was really their ordination address. Now, uh, ordination sermons, <laughs> I, rem I, I can remember mine, uh, and, and my graduation from, from college, I remember from Bible school, I, can I can't tell you what anybody said in any of the other ceremonies, I don't know what they said, but uh, I do remember those. And I can remember, uh, for instance, my Bible school graduate, I can remember a uh, pastor, uh, David Theobald was his name from, uh, from the San Jose area, and, and he preached on he that them that goeth forth and weeping, bearing the precious seed shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing their sheaves with them. And I, I can remember that sermon, fantastic sermon. And it wasn't just to us, it was to everybody. But it was talking about specifically how to take the gospel. And it was, it was beautiful. It was fantastic. And Jesus here is preaching an ordination service for his 12 apostles. So Matthew 5, 1 to 2 says, And seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, now we're not going to, we're going to stop right there on this part of it. Uh, then Luke chapter 16, verses 17 and to 19. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear, hear him and he healed of their diseases as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. So what we see here then um, is that they were up on the mountain. with his. He was up there with his disciples and his newly appointed apostles. And here came the crowd up on the mountain with him. Now, they didn't go up on the two peaks. That's where Jesus had been alone, but in this flat, level area. And it's a large area. You can put, I don't know how many, probably several thousand people in there easily in this flat area. And so they came to him, and he came to this level spot. Here were all this multitude. They came from all over, and again we see Jews and Gentiles alike. And I think, I think Luke was very, very particular in making that statement and identifying the fact that it was not all Jews, but it was also Gentiles. Because what Jesus is going to do is he's going to set them down and he is going to preach what we call the Sermon on the Mount. He's going to tell them and explain to them what is the higher law of truth. And it goes for all of them. And he, but, but notice this. Before he preached, he met their outward needs. He healed everybody that was sick, that was oppressed, that was demon-possessed. He healed them all. All of them. Then after he healed them, 
and he went into, into his sermon. Now, it's interesting. Here's Jesus. He's been up all night praying. He has brought his disciples up and appointed the 12 disciples. And I don't know about you, but I don't think Jesus just called them up there and says, Okay, you, 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 you're my, you're my apostles. I believe he talked to them and told them what the job was all about. Here's what I want you guys to do. I am appointing you to be a preacher, to be a healer, cast out demons. He talked to them. We just have the reason Jesus did it. How did, how did they know why he did it if he didn't explain it to them? So he, pre he prays all night. He preaches to them basically and teaches them what the job of the apostles is going to be and who they are and probably maybe even why he called them. We don't know. He didn't go into that. Then the multitude comes up, thousands probably, at least a couple of thousand from, from history, and he heals everybody that's sick. He casts out the demons. He does all of this. Then he has them sit down. <laughs> and now he's going to teach them. And we sometimes think, man, I've been working all day and I only had an hour and a half's nap before I have to go to church tonight for a couple of hours. Look at Jesus. All right, so now, <clears throat> we go into the Beatitudes, and actually it's the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. So just to be clear, as I've heard, Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount both to the multitudes and his disciples, or just his disciples? That's correct, to okay. all of them. Yes, yes. It's going to be to all of them. And I, as I was saying, this is not uncommon for ordination sermons. Right, okay, so that now, I, I yeah. get it now, the, the context of the, your yes. reference. To, yes, okay. This was really going to be their first lesson in the, up, in the higher law of truth. All right, so here, here we go. Now we're on the mountain. Now, I'm going to break this off into a separate outline so that we can follow a little easier uh, to do it that way. So we come up with uh, the introductory statement concerning the subjects of the kingdom. Who is going to be in the kingdom? What is this thing, kingdom? That was an Old Testament, uh, you know, phrase, and it meant the uh, Messianic kingdom. Uh, that was their typical idea behind that. But he talks about some of their essential characteristics, the sources of their happiness, and some woes in the Beatitudes. So let's read the Beatitudes. Start in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the, excuse me, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 20, Then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did your, their fathers to the false prophets. All right. Uh, 
We're going to kind of just go uh, ad lib through these. Uh, so I don't have a, a lot of um, a lot of stuff written out there for you. What I did do is I made this second these tables, and um, what I tried to do uh, on these tables is to um, look at the the characteristics that uh, both Matthew and Luke present and kind of give you a feel for what they are. First of all, we look at poor. Poor. Now historically, you know, you see preachers all the time talking about how the poor people, uh, you know, that are poor today, and, and uh, you know, we use it as encouragement. You may be poor today, but you know what? Uh, yours is the kingdom of God. You're going to you're going to get the kingdom of heaven, you know, or the kingdom of God, and you know, this is this is something to look forward to. But Jesus was not addressing the physical condition of people. He was addressing their spiritual condition. And notice, I, I like uh, I like what uh, what Luke said. He said that he looked at his disciples. In other words, he, he, he was in effect saying, I'm preaching to you. I'm talking to you. This is your ordination service. All right? And I'm talking to you, but it applies to everybody. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. Matthew's view was poor in spirit. And, and his result of that would be the kingdom of heaven. Luke's view was poor in the world. He had a more, um, I won't say physical view of what he was talking about, as much as the idea that as apostles and disciples of Jesus, they were not going to amass fortunes. They were not going to be concerned with what was around them. They would be considered. Now, he, he obviously didn't mean that they were poor uh, at that point because, you know, we already talked about James and John and Peter and Andrew. Uh, they had servants. Mm -hmm. and, and they had a big house and they were able to throw a big feast. And, you know, they had money. They were, they were prosperous fishermen. And look at Matthew. He was a prosperous tax collector. You know, these guys had money. So he wasn't talking about it in the terms of their physical ability to make money or how much goods they had. It was more that you are, if you're poor, if you count the world's goods as nothing, okay? You see where I'm coming from? Matthew looked at the heart and said, and, and we'll go into a little bit more, uh, if you are poor in spirit, Luke looks at it and says, if you are poor in what you want from the world. If you consider yourself not worrying about the world, right, you'll, you'll inherit the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of heaven, I think I've mentioned this before, I don't know that you can actually split these two apart, like a big axe and split them apart, but kind of think of it this way, the kingdom of heaven is more a Jewish term that had to do with the messianic kingdom. The kingdom of God was a different view that had to do more with the coming church age or the idea of the individual's reign with God. Okay? That kind of helps you a little bit. All right. So that's, we're getting these two different views of what was said. Uh, now, when I look at other scriptures, the need here to be poor means a complete absence of pride. That ties these two together. When you have a complete absence of pride, Psalms 40 and 17, but I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Who said that? David. Greatest warrior in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Peter, yeah. Greatest warrior in the Bible, David. I mean, he was able to go out and throw a sling, and with a sling and slay a giant. And a, I mean, I mean, if somebody didn't need any help, it was David. 
And yet look what he says. I am poor. I am needy. I'm the king of Israel. I've got everything. But I'm poor and needy. He did not allow what he had or his position to take over his heart and give him pride. He was poor. Isaiah 41 and 17. The poor and needy seek water, but there is none. Their tongues fail for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. The Lord of Israel will not forsake them. Not naturally. They, they weren't naturally poor and seeking water. But spiritually, when they became poor, when Israel came to the point in Isaiah chapter 41, where they called out to God and said, we are nothing, we have nothing, we are nothing, and we can be nothing without you. When they put their positions aside, and they, you know, because they were great to say, God, you know, you need to do. We are your chosen people, and you know, we have this special place with you. But when they found out and they put themselves in that position, what then happened? I, the Lord, will hear them. That's when I hear them. When you are poor, mm -hmm. prideless, God hears. That's when you will get both the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of God. In other words, you'll be ruling and reigning in both places. Both the spiritual kingdom as an individual, personal relationship with God, as a personal king and priest with God, and also in the kingdom. You'll receive all the joys of the kingdom. Does that make sense to you? All right. <clears throat> Secondly, to mourn. <clears throat> now, Matthew's view says, that blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now that means, uh, again, I'm, you have to take my word. I'm, I'm, if I went into all of the Hebrew and Greek, we'd be here all night. But we're talking here, he's, he's specifically addressing the idea of poor in spirit. Not poor, I mean mourn, who mourn, I'm sorry, who mourn in the spirit. Now Luke's view is they will weep. Matthew says they'll be comforted, but look at Luke. They're going to laugh. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's strange, isn't it? How can you laugh when you're mourning? Now, you, you, you can kind of get the idea of being poor in spirit and being comforted, but weeping and laughing. Mm -hmm. laughing. Well, when I looked this up, it, it, it means the desire to see the Lord glorified, and to be in His presence. See, what has that got to do with mourning? Isaiah 61 and 3 says, to console, we're talking about the Messiah, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. When we realize where we are, you see, these Beatitudes, they're not as individuals. They actually build upon each other. When we become poor in spirit, when we put our pride aside, when we identify who we are, and we say we are nothing before God. What do we do? We mourn. We want to see God fulfilled in our lives. We want to see Him justified. We want to see Him glorified. And we want to be in His presence. Not just today, but eventually an everlasting presence. We want that. We desire that. And with that desire comes the mourning because we don't have what we desire. Yeah. You see, the idea here is mourning is saying, oh, I got, I've got to have it. I, 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 I've got to have it. It's a determination that says I am nothing. And because I'm nothing, I'm in mourning. 
if you look at the Old, the Old Testament, when they went into mourning, it was because they had lost something. They didn't have something. They no longer had what they wanted. Somebody had died, or they were about to lose their life, or, you know, there was all kinds of things, and they would go into mourning. Well, when you think about it, we lost what we had. We had, for, we had everlasting fellowship with God, and we lost it because of sin. We should be in mourning for that. Wanting that. Desiring that. You say, well, the Spirit of God comes down, and boy, we get with it. Yeah, we do. But it's because we want that. If we don't want it, we're not going to get it. I've had, had people, well, even in this class, I've had people ask me, you know, well, why is it we don't have what we used to have? You, you've heard that bad question asked. Why don't we have what we used to have? Simple, we don't want it. Simple, we don't want it. We don't desire it. We don't see a need for it. We don't put everything else aside and say, this I have to have. We don't put sackcloth and ashes and sign of of having no pride at all and saying, God, I'm nothing. I need you. That's what he wanted. 2 Corinthians 5 and 4. For we who are in this tent, the flesh, in this tent, groan, being burdened, not to be, not because we want to be unclothed, not because we want to die, we want the flesh to go away, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Wow. When we mourn like that so that we desire life, what do we get for that? <laughs> We're comforted. Yeah, but we can laugh. We can laugh. We'll be able to laugh. You ever see the Spirit of God move through a service? I mean, you know, and, and there's somebody standing around, boy, I can't, I just can't stand this. They may be crying, but it's not because they're sorry. Unless conviction's got a hold of them. You know, you know what I mean? We feel the presence of God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what we should feel. All right, the next one is hunger. Mm -mm. Hunger. Meek. Meek. Hunger. Meek. 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 I'm sorry. Meek. Meek. <laughs> I, I can't read either. Meek. <laughs> Blessed are the meek shall they shall inherit the earth. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> now, Luke doesn't even talk about this one. And probably one reason is because it is so close to mourning. Meek. Uh, meek here uh, means lowly or gentle, if you just look at the, the definition. They're lowly or gentle, and if you're that way, you shall inherit the earth. I don't know. I don't want the earth, personally. I don't know. <laughs> Let me get rid of it. But anyway, <clears throat> what does it mean to be meek? It means a true view of one's self expressing itself in attitude and conduct with respect to others. Being meek. I, I read a, um, a thing in one of the books that we were talking about. The, uh, um, in fact, it was this book, Roberts, I believe it was. He was saying he, he went to speak at uh, some, some town, and this guy met him at the train. And took his bag, grabbed his bag right out of his hand. Says, I'll carry this bag for you. He says, I'm an elder in the church that you're going to, or, or deacon. I'm a deacon in the church that you're going to, but I'm just a deacon. I'm a nobody. I'm just, you know, I'm just a, a servant. I'm just here to see that you get to the church. And he was going on and on and on. And the writer says, that was anything but meekness. <laughs> he was trying to make somebody think he was meek. I'm a nobody. I'm just, I'm just an old nobody. Meekness means when we get a true view of ourselves. I don't care who we are. I don't care. Uh, you can be the biggest name preacher on the face of the earth. Or you can be the janitor that cleans the room, cleans up the church. 
or the maintenance guy that paints the walls, or the usher, or the greeter, or clarinet player, or whatever. It doesn't matter. The best, highest position we can get on the earth is nothing before God. We need to look and understand who we are. When we get a view of ourselves and we express that view to others. Now what, do I, what am I talking about expressing that to others? Well, it's in our attitude and our conduct. I remember uh, several years ago, uh, a certain organization that I was in, um, there was a woman that was able to buy Lincoln Continentals cheap. And so all these preachers were lining up to buy these Lincoln Continentals. And she was taking orders hand over fist. <laughs> but after a little bit of time, you know, one or two Lincoln Continentals got <laughs> delivered and the rest of them never came. Come to find out, she was scamming them, you know. She was taking the money and running. But you see, the point is they had to have a Lincoln Continental because in that organization, if you had expensive suit and a Lincoln Continental, you were considered to have reached the epitome of something. I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's looking at yourself and saying I'm more than what I really am. I can think of a church, <coughs> you go in the door, and all you see is pictures of the pastor pastor and his wife. And I don't mean pictures. I'm talking pictures. The latest book. We're having a men's conference. Phew, pastor is going to be preaching. Everything is the pastor's ministry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Last time I knew, all the minister does is minister. You understand what that means? <laughs> Maybe you can it. If he's not speaking the word of God, he's not speaking anything. Mm -hmm. Where does the word of God come from? It, hey, where it doesn't come from is here. It doesn't come here. Yeah, we study. Yeah, I read and I, I think. But when I stand up here, I'm not standing up here to tell you how smart I am. Because that would not work. I am dumb. I'm dumb. My wife, I tell all the time, I'm, probably the, I'm as dumb as a post. But God has given me a gift of understanding things and being able to present those things. But if he doesn't speak it to me, if he doesn't tell me, if he doesn't put it on my heart, it's not going to come out right. Probably get tired of me asking God to anoint. That's because if he doesn't, I'm not. I'll sit down in a minute. If I don't feel the anointing of God, I got nothing to say. Can I preach a sermon? Sure. I can get up and preach. I, I can open the book and I can put a homiletical sermon together in probably a few minutes and, and everybody will say, what a nice sermon. But that's not what I'm up for. I am here because I want to see an interaction. I want to see God do something. Mm -hmm. right? And if I don't put God first, and if I start thinking how smart I am and how good that well, that was a great, great, oh, that was a good lesson last week. If I say that, it's because, thank you, God, you spoke well last week. Mm -hmm. You see the difference? That's the difference in saying, I am really the teacher, and saying, God is the teacher, and he's just using me, and if something happens to me, he may call David to come up here and do the same thing. I am nothing in God's sight except the vessel that he has called to do something. And if, if everybody has that approach, and I'm, 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 I'm not holding myself up, I, but I don't know anybody else to mention it about, because I don't know the heart of anybody else, okay? So please understand, I'm not trying to boast on this. But if everybody would take the word of God and do it the same way, God, I am just doing what I'm doing, not because I can, not because I'm great, but because you have called me to do that, you are working through me. And when I empty myself and understand I am nobody, then when I come up 
to people who want to start something else, I'm not going to say, look, sit down, I've got the education, I know what I'm talking about, I want to tell you what this means. Did you see? That's the difference. It's, it's being able to sit back and listen to what they say and say, well, have you considered this? Have you considered that? What about this? And let them find it for themselves. That's, that's, that's being meek. Showing an attitude and con conduct with respect to others. And, and, and you know, you, you look at the life of Abraham, David, Ezekiel, some of the greatest men in the Old Testament. Look how they treated other people. Lot came to Abraham and said, you know, well, hey, you know our, our shepherds aren't getting along. Abraham could very well have said, look, Lot, you better understand something here. I've got an army of servants. And either you, call, you either calm those shepherds' ears down and lay the law to them, let them know where their position is, or you won't have any shepherds. And he could have done that, right? He had the power. We know because when Lot was taken captive, just his household servants went and destroyed the king and all of his army. So we know he had that kind of authority and power. But what did he do? He said, okay, Lot, you take your choice. Where would you like? You want the mountains or you want the valley? You see, he put himself in the position of saying, I'm nobody. What is important is my relationship with God. If God wants me in the valley, he'll put me there. If he wants me in the mountains, he'll put me there. Lot, you make your choice. I'm making my choice with God. Simple. We look at David. I mean, you know, here's another one. He could have killed Saul. I mean, here's Saul, his sworn enemy, who's trying to everything he can to kill him. And he walks up to Saul, and Saul's laying there sound asleep. He's got a spear. He's, he's got his weapons. Mm -hmm. He could have walked up and, go ahead, in the problem. And probably been justified yeah. in the eyes of a lot of people. He was with his men. They said, why don't you go ahead and kill him? No, 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 no. Take off just a little piece of just a little piece of his garment so I can show him. Hey, you, you know what I almost did to you? And then he had to repent over mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's what we're talking about by being meek. It, it, what it is not is saying, I'm just I'm just don't think I can do very much. We have what we call wallflower. Oh, we got to have a great time Sunday. We need you to come down here. And I don't think I can do that. I'm really not very gifted in that area. <laughs> yeah. We got a whole lot of meek people in this church that fit that category. <laughs> Serious. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, preaching to the choir, I know. You call for something, you call for help, you call people to come, nobody comes. Why? Well, I'm not very good at that. I, you don't want, you know, I'm really, I'm, I'm just not, I, I, I really don't think I can do that. I'm just coming to church and worshiping God. Uh, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. You may be coming to church and praying. You may be coming to church and singing the song. But true worship comes from a heart of servants. Pastor's Sermon Sunday on a servant's heart. Fantastic. Servant's heart. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. We take that a lot of times, and we've used that a lot of different ways. You know, we take it primarily, we throw our cares on him, you know, and stuff, and we take his yoke. We're a Christian, and we bear the, the yoke of the Christian. You know, paying tithes, you know, that kind of thing. It's not what he's really talking about here. When we take the yoke of Jesus, when we look at the world around us, what does he hope for? It's for an ox to pull the cart. That's what a yoke is for. It's not the weight of the yoke. Mm -hmm. It's the weight of the cart. 
If you take the yoke on you, you're pulling. You're moving ahead and you're pulling others with you. You're pulling a cart full of others. If you take, you think about Jesus, he had the weight of the world in his cart. Mm -hmm. You take his yoke on you, you're going to have a full cart. There's too many people running around with a yoke on with nobody in the cart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm serious. That, that's true. So when we find out who we are, we put on the yoke of Jesus, what do we do? We allow ourselves to be servants. We pour ourselves out. We allow ourselves to be used. We treat others with an attitude and conduct uh, to them that says, you are valuable. You are more valuable than I am. I want you in my cart. That's a sermon. I mean, you can put that one together when you did. All right, hunger. <clears throat> Matthew's view. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And what does uh, poor Luke say here? <laughs> Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Hmm. Crave, to Matthew, it was craving spiritual blessings. And to Luke's view, view, guys, I'm sorry, that should be view, V-I-E-W, not the, anyway, he says those that are currently hungry, who were currently hungry? Again, we have this idea. You have Matthew saying, all of you who crave spiritual blessings, and the way Luke puts it, is if you are now hungry for spiritual blessings. Today, now, you're hungry. In the future, you won't be. You have to remember, Luke wrote this sometime after the day of Pentecost and everything. So he's looking back as the historian, as the guy who puts things in order. He says, if you're hungry today, today, you're hungry, what's going to happen? You're going to be filled. But the key is you have to be hungry today. You know, how many times, you know, especially if you were a kid growing up, your mom called you to dinner and you weren't hungry? You had to eat anyway. Okay. And sometimes you can just say, you know, I'm not really very hungry. Oh, okay, well, I'll just take a bite and you can, you know, go on I'm back out and play or whatever, you know, depending on how old you were. But when you're really hungry, you tend to get full. You tend to eat until you're full, if the food is there. Now, if I can go, uh, I can go to uh, um, a buffet. Okay, I can go to a buffet. And if I'm not terribly hungry... I only have a plate, a big plate of salad and a main plate, and that's kind of it. But if I'm hungry, you know, I might eat a big plate of salad and stuff, and then two big plates of chicken, and, you know, and then I'll go get some dessert. I get full. We come to God, we need to hunger and thirst. I like, I like going where they have those big glasses and you can just keep filling them up. Mm -hmm. Eat, fill them, eat. But we need to hunger and thirst. After what? After righteousness. What does it mean? It means we need to strive to be free from sin and all of its manifestations. Psalms 11 and 7, For the Lord is righteous, He loves righteousness, His countenance beholds the upright. Psalms 106 and 3, Blessed are those who keep justice, and he who does righteousness at all times. Proverbs 12, 28, In the way of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is no death. I like what Paul said in Hebrews in the 12th chapter when he's talking about running the race. In case you're wondering, that's one of my favorite portions of Scripture. I use it all the time. But he said, let us cast aside the sins and the weights mm -hmm. that so easily beset us. 
What do we have to do to cast those aside? We have to desire to get rid of anything that would be in our way. That is what it means to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Paul's description doesn't talk so much about hunger and thirst, but it says, you know, you keep your eye on the champion, on the one that's gone before. You want to emulate that. That has to be the big thing, the only thing in your life that you're really focused on should be that. Everything else, we got to get out of the way. You know, if you're out in the desert and you don't have anything to, to drink, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? What's the only thing that comes to your mind? Thirst. I've got to get something to drink. I've got to get something to drink. got to get something to drink. We need to be that way with God. I have got to succeed. I have got to run the race. I have got to finish my course. I am hungry to be what God wants me to be. I am hungry to get where I'm going to get to. Now, I can tell you, somebody used to run. You know, we put in, in college especially, you know, we would get into school an hour and a half, two hours early. And, and we'd get out there, and sometimes it was, it was still dark, sometimes it was foggy and rainy. Uh, there, and down there might even be a little sleet coming down. But we put on our running gear, and we took off and we ran. And we might run 10 miles and come back and shower and go into class, come back after, after classes were over, and, and, and run some more, maybe 17 miles at night, and come back. We'd run around the school, and, and there were different things that we do, you know. Training, why? Why were we doing all that stuff? It had been a whole lot easier to stay in bed another couple of hours, or, you know, come back from, from class and go do my homework, and go home and find something to do. It's because I wanted to win. I had a desire to win. If I didn't have a desire to win, I wouldn't be out there. There's no way you're going to catch me running 17 miles. I look back on it and I think, you know, I must have had a screw loose. <laughs> I mean, we take off from school and it was eight and a half miles down alongside a river. And we'd run alongside that river. In the morning, it wasn't so bad running distance. We wouldn't go that far in the morning just because of time. But at night in Central California at 2.30 in the afternoon, when it's 104, 105 degrees, and you're going to run down that river eight and a half miles, or seven, uh, eight and a half miles, then you're going to turn around and you're going to run back eight and a half miles. Why? I can win. Does that make sense? No. Not, not looking back on it didn't make any sense at all. I must be nuts. I have a few little, few little medals at home. Well, you won this race, and you won that race, and you won that race. And all of that work, and I got a little bronze or gold medal. <laughs> what did it profit me? Well, nothing in the natural world, but it sure has given me a lot of sermon material. <laughs> But that's what we have to have, is that single-minded focus that we are going to finish. And in order to do that, we have to get rid of everything that would make us unrighteous, that would make us not complete the course, not win the race, not get everything God has for me. All right. Merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Just meaning is, is it to be uh, caring and forgiving of others. Caring, forgiving of others, yeah. Okay, if we do that, if we show mercy, um, then we're going to be cared for and we're going to be forgiven. We're going to obtain mercy. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? But let's look at what it, what it means. True forgiveness only comes from true repentance, which is then shown to others. Until we repent, until we have received mercy, we cannot effectively show mercy to others. That's what he's talking about here. Psalms 18.25 With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. 
With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. Ephesians 4.32, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgive one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. The Lord's Prayer, forgive those that have trespassed against, forgive my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. We look at that as saying that's, you know, you, uh, you know, forgiveness of others comes from me. What that really means is you can't forgive others until you first have been forgiven. Effectively. You can, but effectively. And what we're talking about by effectively is what, what is he talking about here? This is the ordination of his apostles. He's preaching them the, the better truth, the higher truth. You can forgive people, but until you have been forgiven, until you have received mercy, you cannot adequately give mercy to others. And have a count. Mm -hmm. I guess I should put it that way. Maybe that makes more sense to you. Uh, you know, you can, you, and until you've received mercy, until God has forgiven you, you can forgive anybody you want to. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't change your relationship with God. I guess that's really a better way to put that. That helps clear that up a little bit for you. All right. Pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's pretty straightforward, pure in heart. But what does it mean to be pure in heart? Hmm. Does that mean we, we, we go take some kind of medication that cleans our heart up? <laughs> I think we have to understand, first of all, what is the heart? And I think we all probably have a pretty good understanding of that. But there are several different, uh, uh, different definitions. One of them is it is the seat of our emotions, uh, you know, whatever. Sum it all up as saying the heart is who you are. It's the inner man. It's the seed of our emotions. It's the seed of everything that we are. It's here. This old flesh is just what people see. But it's what's in here. And so we have to have a pure heart. And this is, this is what that means. Live to the glory of God in every respect. He should be the supreme desire of our life. So what does that got to do with being pure? If we live to the glory of God in every respect of our life, there is no place where impurity can get in. If we go to work and, and work a regular job, and we're doing that for the glory of God, if we're doing that to show people that God is glorified in my work. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about when you go to work and you show up on time and you do your work and, and you're not a troublemaker and they don't have to worry about you, uh, you know, uh, stealing from the company or anything and you're not bad mouthing everything. When you got the gossip going, you know, you're not a part of that. And when you got the jokes going, you're not a part of that. You're doing the best you can do. Does that mean you're going to, you're going to be the best employee in the company doing as far as what you, the work type of, you know, the content of your work? No, but it means you're doing the best you can do. And when you're doing that, you're doing it as unto God. That's why, that's why it says, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do what? In the name of Jesus. That doesn't mean you say, in Jesus' name, I'm going to do this report. In Jesus' name, I'm going to... What it means is, we are doing that, whatever that is, with all of the history, reputation, understanding, knowledge of Jesus. As if He were sitting here doing it. You know, we've often said that. What would Jesus do if He was here? If what would you gotta ask sometimes when we're on the job, what would Jesus do if he were in this job? Because that's really what we need to be doing. When we live to the glory of God, everything we do, whether it's in church, whether it's at home, whether it's on the job, whether it's planting flowers in our flower beds, if we're doing that for the glory of God, not for our glory, 
there's no room for impurities mm -hmm. to get into our hearts. He should be the supreme desire of our life. See how these all kind of tied together? They build on each other. All right, peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The peacemakers strive to prevent contention. <laughs> oh, notice that. Notice that. They shall be called what? Sons of God. What does sons of God mean? Those that resemble God. What do you mean not be contentious? We live in a world of sin. We've got an ungodly president. We've got an ungodly conference, Congress. We've got an ungodly mayor. We've got an ungodly governor. We need to get out there in the streets and we need to see that we get these guys replaced because they're ungodly. Is that really what we should be doing? Peacemakers. We need to look at everything in terms of how it affects others. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. <coughs> now then, we are ambassadors of Christ, and through God, we're pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So what does that got to do with politics? Well, if I read my Bible correctly, it tells us that instead of riling against our leadership, and instead of trying to raise a mutiny and have them voted out of office, and using the, 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 the methods of the world, what does the Bible say? Pray for them. The easiest thing in the world for a Christian to do is pray. It should be the easiest thing in the world is to pray, but how many on a regular basis pray for their leadership? In fact, how many pray at all? Ooh. When we look at Christians, the easiest thing we have and the one that we should be doing the most of is communing with God. He, he said he sets up the rulers. So if he sets up the rulers, what right do we have to work against God? When we go and do those kinds of things, what are we doing? We're putting ourselves at odds with God. We think we're, you know, we think we're, we're out there doing something for God, and we're not. Because we're not doing it the way God wants us to do it. Does he know these guys are ungodly? Certainly, just like he knew Nebuchadnezzar and Shanikarib were ungodly. And they made these guys look like saints. And yet God said, what did he say? He called them his sons. Huh? No, they were the sons. That's what he said. They're my sons. I put them there. Whoa. You mean you control things? You really control things? We, we don't control things? Yeah. yeah, God does. And so we need to be reconciled to God. And how do we become reconciled to God? Following the steps of Jesus. You see, Jesus could have said, when all these people came at him, he's, he's got thousands. He had 5,000 at one time when he fed them with the, with the loaves. And he could have fed them all, and he could have played politics. You know, when you feed people, they'll follow you anywhere. Okay, now I got all of you. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to march into Jerusalem, 5,000 strong, and we're going to pick up people along the way, 
And we're going to demand that the high priest resign. And we're going to demand that the Sanhedrin disband because they're a bunch of ungodly uh, hypocrites. He could have. But he didn't. He allowed himself to be used of God in whatever way God wanted to use him. But even in those things, what did he do? Lay it not to their charge. That's a prayer. Mm -hmm. He prayed for them even when they were killing him. Mm -hmm. Stephen prayed for them even as he was being stoned. That's what he wants from us. He doesn't want us out there causing problems. He wants us to be peacemakers. How do we bring people together? How do we bring churches together? How do we bring different ideas together? Not by debating or, or even discussing, but by sitting down and saying, have you thought about it this way? And if they don't want to be reconciled, fine, it's on them, but I've tried to reconcile. That's what God wants, mm -hmm. us to be peacemakers. Now, we come down to the eighth one. There are seven Beatitudes up till now. If you'll notice, the first three Beatitudes deal with the individual's condition of their heart. The next four, actually, um, well, actually the first three deal with the condition of the heart. The sixth one, uh, which is, blessed are they that hunger and thirst, uh, the fourth one, I'm sorry, fourth one in line, verse six, that shows us a solution to the problem. Starts the solution. Solution is uh, that we should hunger and thirst after righteousness. Uh, we should uh, be merciful. We should be pure in heart. We should be peacemakers. That's the four things we need to do in order to take care of the first three. And the outward things that we would do. Now we come down to verse 10. And he said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. A lot of people misuse that scripture, and they think because they're persecuted, that you know uh, that 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 they're being uh, they're fairly treated, and we should be blessed because we're being persecuted. Well, if you're not being persecuted for the righteous, excuse me, righteousness' sake, you shouldn't be blessed. If you're being persecuted for your own actions, you shouldn't be blessed. Don't expect God to bless you if you're being persecuted for something that you did or said or your attitude or whatever it is. I like the way it actually means. It means being persecuted for being like Jesus. Basically, when you have satisfied the seven Beatitudes, you're going to be hated. Why? Because Jesus was hated. We think that if we're just a good Christian, everybody will like us. I mean, after all, I like me, so everybody should like me. It doesn't work that way. When we get to be like Jesus, we are so different from the world that one of the, out, uh, one of the, the things that happen there is that we become hated. Because uh, John 7 7 says this, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify uh, of it that its works are evil. But they don't hate you because you're you. They hate you because you stand for Jesus. And he tells them they're evil. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. In other words, if you live in the world and you, you're serving the devil and you're doing things, no, oh, they love you. No, oh, you're just like me. Hey, we're going to get along fine. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Wow, that's kind of... Hmm. We get saved to be hated. We desire to be hated. That's really where, the, where it comes down the rubber hits the road, isn't it? And being hated by the world is not a bad thing. Because until somebody hates you, in, in this term, until the world hates you, until they, until they recognize that you are different from them, until they recognize that there is a difference between what you do and what they do, 
Until they reach that point, they cannot accept what you do. But when they get to the point of understanding you are different and what you do is better than what they're doing, that's when they will follow you. But if you're doing things and you just kind of blur the lines and they see you doing some of the same things they're doing, they're not going to compare whether you're better than them or not. You're just one of them. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Now, <clears throat> Luke uh, goes on and he adds uh, these verses at the end. Verse 24. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. That's, that's the negative side, or positive, however you want to look at it, of being poor. If you're rich, if you have everything that you want, if your desires are being met in the world, and you're, 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 you're successful in yourself, okay, um, um, if you have pride and, and you're puffed up and you're, you're letting everybody know that you're rich, that's, that's what we're talking about here, guess what? You have your reward. You've got it right there. That's your reward. Woe to you who are full. Full. Yeah. Yeah, full. Uh, I got everything. I got everything I need. Um... I've got all the sin, all of its manifestations, you know, I'm, I'm living, just living the life of Riley, having a great time. Guess what? You are going to be hungry. Because the time is coming when everything that you have, it, it goes back to the scripture that says, you know, you need to store it for yourselves, treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't corrupt them. When you have been living to the full here for everything that's here, you're building up treasure for yourself here. But when the, when the last trumpet sounds for you, whether it's taps or whatever it is, and you have all of your treasure here, you don't have anything when you get there. If your whole life has been centered around greed, centered around amassing what you can, and we, have, we had an example of that in, in, in my wife's family where somebody died and, and you know, the one person, one daughter got everything and, and, and uh, you know, and shut out everybody else and, and there was all kinds of situations and circumstances and, you know, I don't mind going into all the personal stuff, but it was greed. Her whole life has been gathering, greedy, you know, gathering, gathering what I can get to give for me and I can give it to my daughters, you know. And, uh, well, all of a sudden, boom, massive stroke, and a few days later, she's gone. Where's all of her money? Where's everything she amassed? Where's everything she wanted and was focused on? Didn't want anything to do with God. Wouldn't talk to anybody about God. That wasn't necessary. Well, I'm going to be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now! For you're going to mourn and weep. When you dance in the streets and you have a great time today and you're, you're, the, you're the life of the party and spiritually you have, you have built everything around your joy and your own self-edification and you have everything in your spirit, you know, you just really, man, I'm everything I wanted to be. There's going to come a day when you're going to mourn and you're going to weep. And unfortunately, the mourning and weeping will go on forever. And finally, woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Now this is not talking about, you know, we've got to be careful here because we don't want to, we don't want to leave the impression that men, men should not speak well of us. I mean, you know, they should. But it should not be because of who we are or what we do. It should be because of who we are in Christ and what he does, not what we do. When men speak well of us because we're like them, you know, and we're trying to make them feel good. The reason we know that is because he went on to say, so do their father, fathers to the false prophets. What did the false prophets do? 
They tried to placate those people. Oh, yes, um, yes, yes, everything's going to be fine. You know, oh, yes, yes, everything's going to be fine. You just go off into battle and everything's going to be fine. No problems. One of the, oh, he's a great prophet. But remember, Jehoshaphat looked around and he said, Isn't there a real prophet here somewhere? Yeah. You know, somebody going to tell us the truth? Ah, yeah, but he hates us. I don't want nothing to do with that prophet because he always speaks bad about me. Does it happen to come true? Yeah. Well, now we better talk to him. See, they didn't speak well of him. They didn't like him because he spoke the truth. He spoke from God. It was the false prophets that got all the attention. So uh, they, these are the, what they call the Beatitudes. Um, oh, there's so much more in here, but i out of time. Um, and I don't want to uh, pick up any more. Any questions? <laughs>